This is the Deliberate Talks Weekly Podcast, powered by the Pixelated Egg Digital Ventures. Tune in every week to learn something new about digital marketing and entrepreneurship. And now, over to the voice of your host, Dukshin Adiantaya. Enjoy the show. This is the episode number three of the brand new season of the Deliberate Talks. And today, all the way from Singapore, we have an entrepreneur who's gearing up to share his stories about startups, sales, employee well-being, leadership well-being, and many more such lessons that every aspiring leader should take notes on. So without wasting time, here is Rajiv Lamba. Hi, Rajiv. How are you doing? Hi, Akshin. I'm doing uh, good. I hope uh, things are great for you too. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Rajiv is the founder and CEO of Neurosensum and Service Sensum. And before we get into all the serious talks with him, Rajiv, tell me a bit more about you and where did you start your career and everything around it? So I did my MBA from India and in 2004, I came to Jakarta, Indonesia, Mm -hmm. where I joined one of the research firms. So I've been in the field of market research from the last 17 years. So I was there in Jakarta for approximately 14 years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 2018, I came to uh, Singapore. So been in Singapore from the last three years. So that's in a nutshell about me as well as uh, what I do, which is uh, very much into the market research industry. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and about your companies, tell me about Neurosensum and Service Sensum. How did the idea come to you? And, and, and tell me a bit more about the founding and other things. When we guys uh, sold our previous company, where I was one of the shareholders, it was around 2017. At that time, the, the writing was on the wall that uh, the technology is going to shape up the way market research happens. Mm-hmm. So in 2018, we came up with this concept of neurosensor where rather than asking consumers, can we read the mind of consumers? Okay. Because traditionally in Asia, people, they tend to be very nice and polite. If, they, if you ask them, do you like my product? Do you like my packaging? They normally tell you yes, because they don't want to say no, no on the face. They're not really critical. Right. So this concept of, of reading the mind of consumer or understanding the subconscious mind was very much there. And that's how Neurosensum started, which is using the neuroscience tools that we created in-house. You know, for example, brain mapping, which, is, which can read your brain signals, facial expressions, eye tracking. So the idea was to use these devices to understand what consumers are thinking. Mm-hmm. So when you're browsing an app, when you're watching a commercial, when you're looking at a pack, what is running in your head? How is your facial expression changing? What, what are the signals which are emitting from your brain? So rather than asking a consumer, can we read those signals and understand what part is engaging them, what part is making them confused, Mm -hmm. what part is causing the boredom. So that's how Neurosensum came into picture, which is uh, disrupting the market research industry uh, with the use of neuroscience. So with Neurosensum, we were normally catering to the larger enterprises. Mm -hmm. And suddenly then we saw one more need in the market, which is to have a good SaaS platform uh, which has some smartness, which is what we call as AI. Mm-hmm. And, and these SaaS platforms, a good survey platform, very much good for the Southeast Asian market, where people who cannot afford consulting services, can they use this platform to do their own research? So that's how Service Sensor, which is a SaaS platform, came into picture. Right. And, and you know, with, with this whole thing, where are we heading towards? You know, like you rightly mentioned, traditional research as a concept, you know, you, you used to get those forms you used to fill in, like you rightly mentioned about asking a few people and, and they wouldn't react honestly. But you, you've been there, right, from how the process has evolved, right? How, how much of it has it evolved beyond neuroscience and, and where is this really heading towards? So a very interesting question, um, Darshan. So I'll say that this is heading into two parts. In fact, this is heading into three parts. Mm-hmm. So the first part is where we get into the neuroscience elements especially in the field of innovation. Right. right. Before you launch a commercial or a pack or a product, you want to understand what consumers are thinking, not only what they are rationalizing. Right. Okay, not only their logical brain, but also to, you want to understand their subconscious responses because most of the decisions that we take as consumers are based on subconscious response. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to the field of innovation, neuroscience has started playing a big role around the world. In APAC, we are still in early stages of neuroscience or neuromarketing. But if you look at the developed nations like US, Europe, a lot of companies have already moved towards neuroscience approaches. Mm -hmm. So that I will say is trend number one. Okay. 
So this can be done offline and online. For example, you know, while sending a survey to you, if you can give me a permission of your web camera. So while you're looking at commercial online, I can read your facial expressions with eye tracking using the webcam. Right. And when it comes to offline face to face, of course, I can put a brain mapping device on your head and read your brain signal. Mm -hmm. So this is a trend number one, which is really shaping up the world in a big way, especially in the field of innovation. Second big trend is what we call as a smart survey platforms. What is the meaning of that? Uh, you know, normally when you typically go to any consulting companies, section people they normally come back to you with insights after one month, mm. and that's too too late for for right. for clients because in such a dynamic world, every brand wants to know real time. Right. For example, if you open a bank account, I'm sure ICICI or SBI they want to know on a real time basis what do you think about their opening process. Mm -hmm. So giving them an insight after one month is too late. Right. Because you know, by that time, the customer might be disappointed. They might lose the customer. Their customer might turn out to a competition. Mm -hmm. So there's a big need of a good survey platform, which is omnichannel, where companies can integrate a survey platform to their CRM system, app, website, you name it. Mm -hmm. So the moment a, a customer interacts with a brand or a service, be it offline or online, a survey goes to the customer, they feel the feedback, and the client or our companies or enterprises, they can know their feedback on a real-time basis. Right. They know whether you're happy or not happy. So rather than waiting for weeks and months, everything is on the screen on a real-time manner. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what we call as omni-channel real-time customer feedback. Right. At one-tenth of a price of consulting because everything is real-time. You can create service. You can integrate across channels. You can get the, the feedback real-time. And what has happened also, uh, Darshan, all this textual data, whether it's a survey textual data, whether it's a, it's a social media conversations, whether it's an app review, a companies can look at this information on a real-time basis in the form of summary. Mm -hmm. That's what is called as text and sentiment analysis, and that's what service and some offers, right. which I think is, is a second big trend which is shaping up the entire research industry. Super. Where I want to understand my customer feedback so mm -hmm. that I can act on that customer feedback on a real-time manner and I can improve my customer experience. Right. And that's why people, they call customer experience as a new differentiator. You know, all this while companies have differentiated on price, promotion, packaging, place. Mm -hmm. But now people, everybody says CX is a new differentiator because how right. low can you go on a price? Right, right. So that's the second big trend which is shaping up the market research industry. And third trend is what we call as big data, which everybody's talking about. You know, you've got so much of data with you. How do you make sense of that data? Right. Not manually, but algorithms are able to feed in the information. They're able to give you a recommendation. They're able to tell you how can you increase the CLV of your customers? How can you improve your happiness of their customers? Mm -hmm. So that's the third big trend which is shaping, which is called uh, big data analytics. Mm -hmm. Interesting insights. Thanks for that, Rajiv. And, you know, now I'm, I'm going to dig in more from your business growth perspective. You have a great business story to tell. In fact, your lessons learned from scaling a startup in Asia from zero to $4 million in sales in just under three years. Tell me a bit more about that growth scale and what went behind the scenes in all those three years. So uh, we started with uh, our consulting arm called Neurosensum, and we started our commercial office in uh, Indonesia. So though our headquarters is Singapore, but we chose Indonesia as our number one first market. Mm -hmm. So after getting uh, good inroads with, with Neurosensum Consulting, uh, we started creating Service Sensum. That was way back in 2018. Right. While Service Sensum is a SaaS platform, it took us some time to, to build it, to test it, to create the minimum viable product. And then we launched Service Sensum in 2019. So mm -hmm. while we were selling Neurosensum as consulting, we started selling our SaaS platform around August 2019. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main office commercial has till now has been Indonesia. Uh, so, you know, the money that you talked about, has, majority of that has come from Indonesian market. So as of now, we are working with more than 100 enterprises, mainly large enterprises in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Now, as we speak, now we are, we are moving towards US and Canada. We are trying to target these two markets from India mm -hmm. uh, to expand our customer base. Right, right. In, in this whole process of sales, let's talk about that. How did you put this structure together? to lead to that kind of where you are today in terms of the growth scale. All right. So see, consulting was relatively easy for me 
Uh, nothing is easy in this world. I'll say relative because I've done consulting before. Right. So when it comes to neurosensum, I knew what kind of structure to put. So we hired a head of neurosensum in Indonesia. We hired consultants uh, to to help the head, and then that's how the team got built. Mm-hmm. And we had a separate sales team for neurosensum. Mm-hmm. So it was relatively easy because we knew some of the clients. We had some presence in the market. And uh, and and that business started scaling up. In fact, Neurosensum became profitable within six months. Right. So we started in, in April 2018, and by end of the year, we were anyways profitable as a comp- as a business because that was the mainly consulting arm. Interesting. Right. In Survey Sensum, we took a very different model. So in Survey Sensum, when we started in August 2019, given that it's SaaS, we turned around the approach where we completely went into digital marketing. Mm-hmm. So our way of selling was not outbound. We started creating our brand through digital marketing. We created webinars. During this COVID time, anyways, it was tough to meet clients face-to-face. Right. So we did webinars. We did campaigns, paid campaigns. We did uh, create a lot of content. Mm-hmm. We did SEO. That helped us a lot in terms of generating the inbound marketing demand. Right. And then we created a sales team, which is inbound sales team, which qualifies these leads. And once the leads are qualified, then we have an outbound team because we are normally reaching the larger enterprises in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. And that's how this entire marketing and sales funnel got created for service and so on. Right. Wow. So, so slightly different approach because these two are different teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, they work in a slightly different manner because one is consulting, second is SaaS. And their, their way of marketing, their way of selling, their way of monitoring is also very, very different. Right. Right. Makes sense. Absolutely. Great, great. And, and you know, I'm also going to get into another part of the mistakes and challenges in this journey. I'm sure there might be a lot of, you know, learnings which which weren't planned for. Obviously, there, there are a lot of things that come in your way which you haven't planned for. Some interesting parts of it. During the business journey, did you face any obstacles or challenges that came your way? We did. I think especially for service sensor, we did face a lot of obstacles. I think because, you know, uh, I have never done SaaS before. So that was my first time trying my hands on a SaaS business. Oh, okay. I think getting the right team took time mm-hmm. because I, I, I was not very much aware of uh, the role of a CTO or, or data science role mm-hmm. or, or digital marketing role. So that is something I had to learn a lot uh, in 2018 while I was building that team. Mm-hmm. The big challenge was getting the right people, ensuring that I'm learning things that I've not learned in my life. Right. I was very much an outbound salesperson, and you know, uh, when you build a SaaS, it's a completely different ball game. Right. So that took took a bit of time. Uh, other mistake that I think we did in 2018, when we created Service and some first platform, we went beyond minimum viable product. We created a product which was slightly more than minimum viable. Right. And when we took it to the clients, uh, we understood that they had a slightly different requirements in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Because we're just kind of looking at the competition and we're just trying to getting getting inspired from competition to create a product. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest lesson which that we learned when we took the product to the market, it was not that well accepted. We had to completely revamp it with a very, very new look, mm-hmm. very different features. So looking at competition sometimes is, is useful. Getting inspired from them is useful, but uh, you know, looking at too much into detail of what competition is, is doing, Sometimes can backfire, right. yeah. Because the companies which are targeting uh, mainly the base from US or Europe, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that they can be successful in in Asia. Right. So I wasted seven to eight months uh, in 2018, uh, mid 2018 till early 2019, mm-hmm. where I had to kind of revamp the entire product. And then I think that's where we learned the art of developing a product. That how do you create a minimum viable product and then get customer feedback? Right. So ultimately, you don't you can start the product on a hunch. But it, ultimately, it's the customers which help you to shape the product better. Right. right. So yeah. that is something that we learned in this journey where our customers ha- have ultimately helped us to add more features, give us more feedback. And that shaped us the product of service and some, which is what is right now, which is loved by the clients. Right. Absolutely. Very key learning there. And, uh, you know, as, as a leader also, you speak very powerfully on prioritizing mental wellness. You know, a major point of conversation in startups today is talking about giving importance to mental wellness. But, you know, most of the working culture doesn't lead to really an employee wellness or even a leader mental wellness aspect of it, right? So what's the motive behind this? Is it based on any personal or professional experience of yours? I think it is. uh, Till three years back, uh, I used to think uh, 
working 17 hours a day, 16 hours a day is something which can really give you enormous results. Mm-hmm. But over time, I felt that I also changed as a leader. I think uh, rather than you controlling everything, can you trust people more and start delegating more? Mm-hmm. That is something which really helped us to to come to a very, very good place where we are right now as an organization. I think apart from that, uh, you know, during these COVID times when we all of us were working remotely, I think everybody kind of went through a phase where there's a bit of self-isolation people they faced, including my own team members. I think mm-hmm. the entire world faced a similar issue. Uh, so how do you encourage people when you're not able to meet them, when they are just sitting at home, they are not able to meet their team members, they're not able to get to the level of productivity that they want to get. Sometimes sitting across a face is very easy to communicate. Doing it over a Zoom is not that easy, especially when they're, they're communicating with the juniors. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where I think this the entire mental well-being for yourself as well as for your employees becomes very, very important. And I think that possibly, I believe, started with me two years back when COVID hit, when we were not able to travel. And I think, uh, of course, you're trying to deliver on the target. Suddenly the, the business gets in, impacted and you're trying to fundraise raise at the same time. Mm-hmm. So multiple elements were happening at that time. And I think, of course, I also saw uh, some of the team members were getting stressed. Uh, they were not able to sell as much as they wanted to sell mm-hmm. because of the, the current uh, situation that we are in. So I think uh, that's what I believe uh, the entire journey of, of transformation started, where I had to take up this uh, a step for above in my life. You can only change the world when you change yourself. Right. Right. So being... Uh, very aggressive to showing more compassion is very, very important, mm-hmm. especially in the times which are very, very tough right now. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, where everybody is trying to deliver their best, but they're not possibly at times able to deliver the output that they want to deliver. Mm-hmm. So how do you balance that compassion when you're not able to meet them face to face? We are not able to have a drink or have a chit chat at times. So how you do it over, over the Zoom became very challenging in the initial time. But I think that's what I think I realized uh, Developing a self-compassion as well as compassion for others becomes very, very important. Right. And to, to me, I think uh, the more compassionate that we become to ourselves as well as our employees, the more credibility, the more loyalty, the more trust that you can gain. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. And uh, this is what, what I felt uh, was a big change in me in the last couple of years. Right. Very interesting. And again, as an entrepreneur, if I ask you from where you started to where you are today, of course, this conversation is very relevant, what you're saying. But how have you shaped yourself better and how are you planning to prepare yourself for tomorrow? Because a situation like how you mentioned in COVID, you had to evolve to become a better leader as well and understand your employees because you're not meeting them face to face. All these challenges will keep coming. Uh, and as you grow bigger, you know, there will be more challenges that will come into the picture. So how are you gearing up yourself as a leader or an entrepreneur to to constantly evolve with time? So I will say, I think uh, what I realize, uh, Darshan, that you know, if you want to become a great leader as well as a great human, both ways, there are three fundamental pillars which are very, very important. Mm-hmm. The first pillar is a physical pillar, which is you have to be physically active. Right. Because of course, you know, uh, you can only put in effort when you're physically well and you're physically healthy, mm-hmm. which I think I was always uh, very much into sports. Uh, I used to kind of play tennis, which I still play. So physically, I was always uh, healthy as an individual. And I think in the last two years, apart from doing what I used to always do, like tennis, squash, I started adding yoga into my uh, physical regime. Because I think, you know, when you've been sitting on chairs for so long and your back gets stiff, hard sports doesn't help. What I realized that yoga is very, very powerful as a tool, as an exercise, which can really help you to balance your mind, body, and soul. So that's one element which I felt that I added some more elements of physical well-being and also encourage at the same time my team members to walk, exercise, not to be just sitting behind the computer 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, overall what has happened, the productivity has gone up, but number of meetings have also gone up and burnout has gone up. Right, right. So taking those breaks where you're away from phone, away from laptop and defining a good schedule for yourself when I will exercise, when I will work becomes very, very important. Mm-hmm. So that is something I did. Second is what I call it as an intellectual pillar, mm-hmm. where you learn a lot by learning from others as well as you learn from yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think attending a lot of web webinars, attending virtual sessions, training sessions, listen, listen to podcasts, reading books, both 
soft skills as well as hard skills. That is something I did a lot in the last few years. Mm-hmm. And of course, networking, physical networking ha- has gone down, but virtually, I think, thankfully, to the thanks to the technology, I could be able to network with many, many pe- people across countries, mm-hmm. especially entrepreneurs, and learn from them. All right. So, which I think is, is what I did a lot uh, in the last two, three years. Uh, I create, did webinars. I attended webinars. I attended a uh, lot of uh, virtual training programs that helped me to understand where the where the w- word is moving towards in my industry, mm-hmm. and especially where the leadership is moving towards. But third big element I'll say, which I added recent in the last two, three years, is what I call as a spirituality pillar. Okay. Now. You might be great physically as well as intellectually, but if you if you don't have a good mindfulness around what you do, then everything goes for a toss. Mm-hmm. Which means if your mind is constantly uh, giving you a chatter, which happens with many many entrepreneurs, because we are trying to multitask. So I saw that with me. I saw that with many many other individuals that I interacted with. Mm-hmm. So people might be playing a game, but they are thinking work, right? Because you know most of us are working from home. So the thick line between Personal and professional has become very thin. Mm-hmm. So people are sitting with their kids, watching movie with their kids, but they're thinking work. Right. When they're working, they're thinking kids. Right. Uh, or they're thinking shopping. So mm-hmm. I think to being very mindful and stopping that mind chatter took me some time, and it takes a lot of practice, right? People talk about meditation. Right. They talk about pranayam. Yeah. Uh, so how do you control your stress in situations like this? And more importantly, how you stop that mind chatter mm-hmm. and convert those thoughts into very, very positive thoughts. How you see abundance within you, how you feel that you yourself can be good enough to take things forward becomes really, really important, uh, especially in the in the age right now where the interactions are very, very limited. Mm-hmm. I think that is something I really added uh, in the last two, three years, which uh, has helped me a lot to being sane, mm-hmm. move the company towards the path of growth. Keeping my leaders sane, keeping my employees sane, and I'm very thankful to what things that I learned that I could pass to my team members and the surroundings. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Okay, then Rajiv, I'm now going to change gears and uh, ask you some more quick questions. The rapid fire round starts in three seconds. So, are you ready for this? Sure. Cool. Your favorite motto or quote in life would be? Even impossible says I'm possible. Mm-hmm. Okay. Self-growth, mindful growth, or monetary growth? Prioritize. I'll say mindful growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, self-growth. Uh, third will anyways happen, right? If you're mindful of your growth and <laughs> you're able to add things in your life, then monetary growth is a, is a resultant. Right. Okay. One interesting story or thing someone said to you when you were going to start your company. When I started my company, I think I'll say that when I when I went to my previous startup, that was something interesting. A lot of time, you know, sometimes you don't want feedback from people, but they still give you feedback. Uh, it's a very human nature. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I remember 90% of the people they said, because I was working in a big organization called Nielsen. Mm-hmm. So I went from Nielsen to my previous startup. 90% of the people they said, uh, you're making a big, big mistake. At that time, it was not a startup, right? People used to call it a business in right. 2011. Right. So 90% people said you're making a big mistake of joining from a big to a small company. In a matter of six months, it will close down. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that you will come back to Nielsen again. But only two people told me, believe in yourself uh-huh. and uh, keep putting in effort. Just believe in the karma. Results will be taken care of. One uh-huh. of that was my my ex-boss and second, of course, is my wife. Uh-huh. Very interesting. And are those 90% people still your friends today? <laughs> but they are still friends. So I don't know how deep friends they are. Uh, so with some of them have not interacted. But of course, right. they would have seen my journey. So I don't know how, how they feel about that journey. <laughs> right. Okay. Three individuals or business leaders you look up? See, I, I don't really look up to a lot of business leaders. Of course, you know, I like uh, the guts of Elon Musk. That when I read about, about him, I like what Steve Jobs did. But to me, uh, my inspiration normally comes from the sports personalities. Mm-hmm. So I don't look up to the sports, sports personalities. For example, I have always looked up to Federer, mm-hmm. uh, how he changed from a very aggressive man to a calm and composed individual. Right. Right. I look up to Sachin, all the glory that he got, how he was always humble with that glory. Right. I have looked up to Dhoni. Mm-hmm. Uh, at such an age, he became a captain and be so calm, composed in different situations. Ability to walk away. From, from things that he felt that he could not lo, lo, no longer contribute. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. are the three personalities that I have looked up to. Very interesting. Okay. It's wiser to find out than suppose is a famous quote. Do you deem this apt for research and entrepreneurship? If yes, why? If no, why? I, I completely believe in it, you know. I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes you will only discover when you get your hands dirty. Mm-hmm. And you can only get your hands dirty when you find out by yourself. Right. See, I think as an entrepreneur, I think it's very important what issues that we're solving mm-hmm. and how we're going to shape up the future, right? right. If right. you just go back to the suppose element, then suppose element at times will only tell you the rear view. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's a history which has been written in the past and that history might tell you the future is not going to happen soon. Right. But when you find out by talking to people, by, by doing things by yourself, you might understand the future which people they're saying will happen 10 years down the line. It might happen, happen in two years, mm-hmm. which is, I think, is a journey that I love, which is finding out. Right, right. Interesting. Okay. And finally, what's planned next for you? I think what's planned next for me, I'll say as a company, I think uh, one is to expand further in Southeast Asia. But I think for us, the biggest challenge will be to expand into developed markets. Okay. Especially for service and some platform where SaaS is valued more and the market of the SaaS is far bigger. So I think for us to crack US, Canada, Europe is mm-hmm. going to be a big challenge mm-hmm. for me as well as my team teammates. So I think that is a challenge that we are looking up to. Okay, great. And before we sum up our conversation, Rajiv, your three to five quick tips on a conversation that you often mention, very valuable, which is how to become a quality leader of tomorrow. In quick three to five points, what would you tell the aspiring leaders? I'll say the first thing is believe in yourself. At times, people might tell you that you're doing the wrong thing, but believe in the intuition that you have. Mm -hmm. Second, show a lot more compassion towards your employees. Mm -hmm. I think the more compassionate they are, I think in a world where loyalty is going down, Showing more compassion, knowing them more, help every all of us a lot more. Right. Third, I will say is being being mindful mm-hmm. of everything that we are doing and having a good balance around the work, professional, personal life. Mm-hmm. And that can only happen when we are mindful and have a great self awareness. Right. Great. And uh, with that, Rajiv, we have come to the end of today's episode. Thank you for making time for this productive conversation. I had a great time hosting you. I hope you enjoyed your time on the show as well. Same here, uh, Darshan. I, I love this uh, podcast. And what I loved about it is it's not long. It's very short and sweet. <laughs> Thanks for keeping it short and sweet. Right. Great, great. I wish you all the very best. And uh, yeah, best wishes always. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Take care. And so that brings us to the end of today's conversation. And before we wrap up today, here's the interesting fact for the day. According to a statistic, 69% of millennials believe that there is a lack of leadership development in their workplace. Now then, that's something to ponder about. And so that's it for today. This is Dakshana Dyantaya signing off. Don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite audio platforms and get in touch with me on the deliberate talks at gmail.com. Join in next Monday for a new episode. Until then, inspire and be inspired.